All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, what do we got? Three people so far. That's pretty cool. Um, so where do we leave off yesterday? Um, sorry, I'm still sort of waking up. So this is what we have left over from yesterday. I started draining off a little bit of the liquid um, um, after the foam dropped back down. This is some of the liquid that I've drained off which, you know, as you can see, it's still quite red, quite nice, which means that um, there's definitely still some more colouring material that we could get out of this. But, you know, what we'll do is we'll filter off the pigment from here, and then once we do that, we'll try and do a second extraction from the leftover liquid. Um, but... Before we get to doing any of that this morning, I just got this parcel in the mail, so this isn't really an unboxing channel, but let's do a quick unboxing of this just to see what it is. I believe that it's some new crucibles, which is cool because I definitely needed some fresh new crucibles for doing some more work. Um, so yeah, welcome to the Alchemical Arts unboxing. And watch me open a cardboard box if I can. Apparently, I can't. Alrighty. There we go. Look very well bubble wrapped. Nice. Alrighty. Get rid of you. Clear a bit of space. Beautiful. There we have a nice big alumina crucible. It's a good size. Um, I've been using these particular ones quite a lot for a lot of my pigment work. Um, they fit, you know, I mostly use these for doing the cobalts and stuff like that, and they fit about maybe 100 to 200 grams of cobalt pigment in there per batch, which is pretty useful. Um, they do wear out over time. I've had a couple of them start cracking, and I've been doing a bit of the manganese blue, and that tends to leave a residue permanently on the crucible. So it's gonna help to have more crucibles. Plus the other thing with the kiln now, and if I start um, upping, upping the amount of um, pigment I make. The good thing about these particular crucibles is they're stackable, so I'm able to make stacks like this where the one on top acts as a lid for the one below, and you know, eventually I can stack up, you know, four or five of them, and then I can do big big batches of cobalt pigments or any of the pigments that need calcining in the kiln. So that's going to be really handy. Um, so I might pick up a few more of these as things go on, but it's good just to keep getting more stuff. Um, the other thing we should look at this morning too is our pomegranate pigment has... I'll come over closer. So. Here's where we're at with the pomegranate pigment. As you can see, it's starting to dry, and as it dries, it's getting definitely darker um, in color. It's still very wet. It's sort of like a plasticine sort of consistency now, but it's gone very almost like a, a golden yellow ochre with a sort of browny, sludgy kind of color to it. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how that looks as an actual dry pigment, um, but that'll probably take a few days because I don't really want to force dry it. I just want to see how it dries naturally. All right. So let's um, also review a few of the other things we were doing yesterday. Um, 
So, in this speaker here, this was the one that was originally the sulfuric, no, this was the hydrochloric acid um, soak that I did. Remember the small 10 grams that I had yesterday where I um, uh, let that sit overnight in the hydrochloric acid and then we wash the acid out and then we put it into a um, alum solution, so the potassium aluminium sulfate. And so what we'll do today is we'll try and extract the colour from this to see if there's any difference in that method compared to the other method we did. Um, this was the pomegranate pigment that we added the iron to, um, which has gone really black now, sitting in the water. It's still a black greeny thing, so we'll, we'll filter out the pigment from that and have a look at it. And then we'll also get through this today as well, which was the other one that I had sitting over there that I didn't do anything with yesterday. But this is the sodium sulfate um, soak. So I've actually found the information I need for this on the computer here, so we can talk through what this is. But let's start by getting this pigment out of the way. Is everyone today still at home? So a bunch of the pigment has actually started drying on the walls of the container here, so that's always fun. But what I think I'll do, I'm just wondering whether I should gravity filter this or vacuum filter it. Um, if I gravity filter it, it'll be through a cloth, um, and if I vacuum filter it, it'll be through the vacuum. I'm thinking, I'm not sure if it's too much to vacuum filter and take too long, or, I don't know. Let's vacuum filter it. That might be the way to go. So it was um, yesterday's sort of look, make, like the work we were doing yesterday, does it make the matter pigments make a bit more sense, or do you feel like you're getting a bit more of a handle on how to do them um, if you were to try them yourself? Um, I'm not sure, because I'm just trying to yeah go through getting a little bit more refined process. Vacuum cable there. What pigment is that? The red color. This red color here. Um, this is all the Matter Lake stuff that we were working on yesterday. Um, so yeah, everything here is is the Matter pigment. Bucket, yeah, that's the matter lake from yesterday. The one that frothed up massively, and now we're trying to filter out the liquid. Yep, 
this will probably take quite some time to filter through, so it may be something I'll just pop completely to the side. Um, the matter pigments are notoriously slow at filtering um, because the pigment's really gelatinous um, when it's first made, and so it tends to yeah, take a long time. Considering the, this is now that full, this could take close to an hour probably to suck all the way through. So, I think what we'll do is we'll put that to the side because it's kind of annoying and in the way. That's a bit quieter. Um, I assume everybody can still hear the pump in the background, but hopefully it's not too annoying. Um, let's move on to this one here. some gloves on. Um. Alright, so this here is what we, so the matter was originally soaked overnight in a 17 to 20 percent solution of hydrochloric acid to try and attack the plant material to break down the cell walls in order to make it release more coloring material. Then we washed the sulfuric, a oh, sorry, we washed the hydrochloric acid out of the plant material. We then, good morning, or evening, whatever time it is there. Um, yeah, then we washed the plant material, then we heated it up with a potassium aluminium sulfate solution, which I've left sitting here like this. So now we're going to just take out the plant material from the liquid, and then we'll try and precipitate the pigment out. So, and see if there's any major color difference or advantage compared to what was in the bucket here. So, just pour. that out and then discard that. And what I might do is I might just quickly wash this out and we'll um, work from there.
Uh, the other thing we'll have to do is we'll have to heat this liquid up because that was the other thing that I was going through yesterday that I think is an important part of the matter is when you're ready to precipitate the pigment out with the soda, um, you want your solution to be warm um, for various different reasons. So we'll start by just filtering it through with some cotton wool just to make sure that it's completely free from any extra particles and bits and pieces. It's hard to tell, I know this is like already had an extraction from it, but it's definitely a difference in the color and it's quite cloudy at the moment, um, which I'm not sure if that's just because it's cold and we need to heat it up. So we'll see if heating it up has an effect. So thermometer in there, we'll get this warm. While that's heating up, let's go through this experiment here. So, what I'll do is I'll read to you what I'm the instructions, I guess, that I'm following for this. Um, let's put this over here. So, this experiment that I'm doing here is based on a um, a book that was released by the National Gallery of Washington um, basically they released four volumes on artist pigments and sort of particularly pigments of historical note How about to buy the pieces of root instead of the powdered one in order to cut the costs? Um, I'm not entirely sure if there... When I've bought the matter in the past, it's, it depends. Sometimes it comes powdered, sometimes it comes just as like chunks of root that I have to powder up myself. Um, but um, I don't know if there's a price difference between the two. Um, again, I think it'll vary on who your supplier is, wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, and so, yeah, it will just vary from supplier to supplier. Um, I just happened to get powdered stuff this time with this order as opposed to, to the chunks of root that I got last time. Um, from, I don't know if it was the same people, but I think it's ultimately the same supplier. Um, so, <clears throat> we'll see. Ultimately, what I'm hoping to do is get a, a hook up with this um, supplier for the uranium matter because I think it's just way fresher and higher quality growing. So, eventually if I can get that, but they don't have any specific su suppliers and the guy that I'm talking to is in contact with the farmers and stuff like that so eventually we'll get something really good happening but anyway back to the matter at hand matter very good terrible pun sorry um 
So yeah, this method I'm doing here was from the Artist Pigments Volume 3. And so it says here, Since alizarin and purpurin, the two main components of matter, are insoluble in cold alkali sulfates, you take one kilo of matter, which I've done 10 grams here, or 9 grams I think to be specific, and you leave that for 12 hours in a solution of sodium sulfate. Um, so they said one kilo of sodium sulfate in 12 liters of water. So I've done nine grams in 200 mils of water or something. Anyway, then we filter off the residue and we keep the root material and discard all the rest of it because the sodium sulfate should be extracting all of the... Um, it should extract uh, tannins and things that we don't want in our final color. So we'll start by doing that. Um, the process then goes on to say you, t you wash the root material until there's no sulfate left in it. And then we take a boiling solution of potassium alum. Where's my alum? So we'll make up a boiling solution of the alum and then we will put the root material that we've taken out of here into the boiling solution of alum and we'll let that stand for 20 minutes then filter it and take out the root material wash the root material clean and take the liquid that we've got so let's get to that stage and then we'll explain the next bit so i don't overload you with information so again what i think we'll do Some questions while I'm doing this. Yeah, I'm super hyped to um on, let me just get this screen back up. I'm I'm super hyped to get into doing the Vertita Azurite sort of stuff as well. Um I think it's really cool, especially because if I can figure this out, how to do the copper pigments. It's going to be awesome, because I really like them. They're not necessarily the greatest pigments, and that's why they never got popular. But, I don't know, I have something about copper I've always liked. Um, again, I've chosen a piece of cloth that is too small. <laughs> need to get some... I need to go to the fabric store and get some more cloth. This is at about 45 degrees so far. I wish I knew where my stir bar was. You've been trying to make a Zurite for several years. Um, does it always turn out that sort of weird duck egg greeny blue color as opposed to a nice pure blue? Like, I assume you're trying to look for that nice, beautiful sky blue or deep sky blue color and you just get the duck egg green. Because that's mostly what I get. Um, occasionally I get the right thing. I think I have a small sample somewhere of one of my attempts at the Azurite. I can pull that up and have a look for you. Alright. So, I don't know if you can see there, but we've got quite a like brown liquid coming off of this. The other thing about the copper pigments that I find really difficult to figure out is also the green, the malachite. Yeah, all I know is it's copper, basic copper carbonate. Yeah, exactly. That's the challenge is to how to get it basic 
by basically mean alkaline, which means it has an extra OH group in it, so it's got a hydroxyl group in there. Um, right, we'll discard this liquid. Rinse this out. The risk though when you're trying to add that OH group to the copper carbonate is you end up over oxidizing it and then just it turns to copper oxide which is brown. Um, or at least that's what I've found. Again, let's get rid of this. Another wash here. What it might do. I'm gonna have to do a stream on the, the copper carbonate. Everybody seems to be more interested in that. Um, yeah, so I don't think it matters what you use as long as you start with copper nitrate. Um, I think that's the really important part. So I'm just gonna dump the plant material back into a big amount of water here so that we can really make sure we rinse all of the sulfate, the sodium sulfate out, because we wanna make sure we get it all removed. Coming up to temperature, so I'm just going to turn that off. I really like the like washing and cleaning and purifying element of pigment making, especially when working with these natural materials. Like it's like nature creates the ability to make color, and it's up to us to sort of like figure out how to refine that out. So it's, it's, I don't know, I find it a really enjoyable process, the idea of trying to get these usable colouring materials out of stuff and make them as pure and as vibrant as we can. Oh, right, yes, I forgot to answer the question of how much pigment can you get from a kilo of matter. That's a really hard question. I think that relies a lot on efficiency of extraction, um, what methods you take and stuff like that. Like, and I've never done a whole kilo at once. I've only ever done 100 gram batches. And I think if I was to estimate from memory, because I, again, I really need to take more detailed notes, but um, from memory, when I've done 100 gram batches, I've potentially got close to maybe 35 to 40 grams of pigment out of 100 grams. So that's what, about 30 to 40% yield. Um, so that would make a kilo give you about 300 
plus grams. I reckon... Uh, and part of doing these experiments is to try and find out what the most viable method is. But I, I feel like we could improve on that 30 to 40% yield. And especially because you can reuse the plant material multiple times, especially if you like re-soak it in acid or re-ferment it and let it sit. Um, then you can essentially get pull more and more out of it. It gets weaker and weaker the more you do it, but there's no point wasting it if you've got it. And even if you get a sort of lighter, duller pigment, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You can still... Alright, this should be the last wash to get rid of all of the sulfate. whole litre jar you made last night. Um, so the batch that I did last night was 100 grams of matter root in, you know, ended up being, yeah, about a litre of liquid, which will then be, once it's precipitated and washed and dried, honestly, that'll probably come out to be about, as I said, yeah, about 30 grams of pigment, maybe, maybe slightly less, um, which will then mix into the watercolour binder, so you'd probably end up with about 40, 45 to 50 mils of watercolour paint from that whole batch, which is about, a, that's a fairly large tube of watercolour paint, um, but look at that, the liquid we're still getting off is definitely coloured. I don't know if we're losing colouring material or if we're just getting rid of junk we don't want. It's not not entirely clear at this point. Yeah, I think 30-40% is a pretty good yield. Um, plant material back in here. Let's just do this again. This seems to be quite effective. Yes, it is really good that you can just keep using the matter root over and over to try and get more out of it. Because, as I said, it's not exactly cheap. Um, I mean, at one stage it would have been cheap because there were just fields and fields of it growing across Europe. Um, matter was one of the most important dyeing materials there was, and it wasn't until it was the alizarin was artificially synthesized that, um, that just killed the industry overnight. Alright. So, I might change gloves because they're covered in stuff. Yeah, I think if I did the um, acid wash step at a higher temperature with sulfuric acid and really made the that then then we might get a better yield but again as I said the other day I'm not super keen on boiling sulfuric acid at this point in time um, we'll get there but I just haven't quite put the energy into setting up to safe setup to do that yet and you know, working in the sort of home 
amateur lab here. It's like there's limitations to what I can do safely. Yes, it was absolutely used as a dye for the English red coats. But yeah, the, the synthetic um, synthesis of alizarin just led to an instant overnight destruction of the industry. Alright, so before we continue with this, let's, um, let's just finish off this here so that we can say that that's done. So all this needs now is some soda to precipitate it out and we'll, we'll have a whole nother batch of pigment. Again, I'm just going to use a teaspoon. Um, of soda, so it's probably, uh, you know, couple of grams. Maybe we'll go a teaspoon and a half. Usually I think you want your, your soda solution to be about 10%. And I've got some hot water here from the kettle. Here. Now let's hope that this beef is not too small and it doesn't just explode everywhere. So we'll add the soda very carefully and slowly. Interesting. Having the both solutions be hot means that the frothing seems to be quicker but less um, less like meringue. Forwards. Oh, uh, well. Maybe I spoke too soon. No, it's frothing just the same as it always does. Um, we're getting a precipitate forming. Um, let's try and get this closer to the camera. It's so hard to see. I wish, I wish I had slightly better camera set up, but anyway. Okay, so that's interesting. So having both solutions be hot definitely makes the froth go away quicker. Oh, 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 oh. Come on. All right, all right. Um. Yeah, the, the bubbles in the foam are definitely um, easier to knock back and sort of more expanded. I think maybe the heat is... So the sugar bonds you were talking about last night broken down by the sulfuric acid is the byproduct carbon or soluble sugars. I think it's soluble sugars or the sugars, I'm not entirely sure, I'll have to read a bit deeper into that, but I think what you end up with is what you're breaking down becomes the alizarin. So it's like the sugars contain the alizarin and um, precursors in there 
and maybe there's some carbon byproducts because you know well sugars are carbons so there probably is but so we're definitely getting a precipitate um i'm not sure if we're done yet here yeah. Yeah, there's definitely more precipitating out. It's actually, it's similar color to what we yielded in the bucket there. Um, but, it's cool. So the idea of having both solutions hot, because I think yesterday when I did the bucket, um, my soda solution was at room temperature, whereas this time it was at the same temperature and It really makes a difference. We really have had a significant like quicker turnaround on the foam. So let's do a tiny bit more. I Think we've reached our maximum precipitation um, So we'll let that settle to the side um, We'll let the pigment settle out and we'll move back to this guy here. But that's cool. Alright, so we learned something. Yes, when you add sulfuric acid to sugar, you get carbon and steam. I think to this, you'll get the blackening of the root material, which is probably the carbon coming, like the carbonization of the root material. Um, but again, I haven't done enough experimenting with that. Alright, so what's the next step with this? Oh, we need a boiling solution of alum. So, we'll get ourselves another thing. Uh, so I'll just put the kettle on to boil and then we'll put into here we're going to put nine grams of alum. Pretty happy with that. It's pretty pure and clean looking color. Like it's, yeah. I think maybe there's some advantage to the to the to the overnight acid soak. Thirteen people watching. Thanks for everyone for j tuning in. It's really fun having people here while I work. That's seven, nine grams. I'm just going to put that in there because we're going to add boiling water. So, freshly boiled kettle. Making another cup of tea here. Probably bring it up to about 250. No, we'll go up to 200 mils. And give that a stir. Leave the instructions. Oh, we should make sure that, yeah, not all of the alum is dissolved, so we'll just keep stirring it. So, yeah, alizarin crimson is made from matter. Um, so, yeah, matter root has two main coloring chemicals one is the alizarin, and the other one is purpurin. Um, and there is a thing, there are about 20 different organic chemicals in 
the um, matter root, but the main two that are, add color are the alizarin and the purpurin. Um, the alizarin is much deeper, sort of crimson, dark red color, and the purpurin is a bit more pink. And then there's another one called pseudo purpurin um, that is also a pinky sort of color. Uh, this extraction is the one that I soaked for about a day or so in sodium sulfate. Um, because the, the color, the alizarin and the purpurin don't, um, aren't soluble in uh, sulfate. So the idea was that by soaking it in sodium sulfate, we could um, extract unwanted um, material from the, the root material before... Um, before doing the color extraction. Yeah, so the sodium sulfate was sort of like an additional purification step. Um, but the next steps of this are actually really different and I'm interested to see what happens. So we'll get into that in a moment. But the instructions said to just add boiling matter, uh, boiling alum, and then leave for about 12 to 15 minutes. So we'll set that aside. Uh, purpurin, um, hang on, I will bring up what, how you spell that. go. Purpurin is P-U-R-P-U-R-I-N. Before continuing the next bit, I will... Okay, now let's go through the next next bit, yeah. Nope. No, no, that's not. Um, uh, by the way, the what's going on in the filter funnel is it's dropped by about that much. So, what's that been? About 20, 25 minutes since we put the thing on? So, it's getting there. It'll take time. Um, it appears that I've thrown out all of my, um, failed... Oh, actually, no, hang on. Yeah, I've thrown out all of my failed copper, um, copper carbonate experiments, um, just because they weren't good enough to keep, um, even for prosperity's sake. Um, this looks like we could probably filter this off too now, um, but the filter funnel's in use, so maybe we'll, um, again, we'll just leave that there. I guess I can show you what it looks like when we, let's heat this up as well. Um, because we can do second extraction from the leftover material. So this liquid here is the leftover liquid for, that I poured off from the bucket yesterday. So we've already extracted one lot of pigment, and now we'll see what a second lot of pigment extraction from the same liquid is. Um, because you can extract a cup, you can add more soda a couple more times to just get a little bit more out of it again and again. really nice. We'll get that back up to temperature. 
Um, we should have had a timer for this. Yes, I could roast the copper carbonate into copper oxide and then add nitric acid to make the copper nitrate, but I just ordered some copper nitrate recently for quite cheap. So I, it's just, I already make enough chemicals from scratch that I, you know, sometimes you just gotta buy stuff in to speed up the process. Um, actually, we will filter this off because I need this beaker. Minor flask I was using yesterday and the pomegranate is left a bit of a residue in there that I'm gonna have to try and get off at some point with I don't know sodium hydroxide wash or something a bit annoying um, so we're just gonna use good old gravity filtration here Is there any particular pigments, apart from copper, um, that people would really like to see me attempt? Because um, I'm always sort of looking to expand and experiment, and yeah, I'd like to know if there are any really like favorite pigments that people have that they'd love to know how they're made and stuff like that. Because that could be fun. Oh dear, this is going to be painfully slow. I can tell right now. What is Gallo Gallo Reno? Um, yeah, what what is? It's interesting you say that. Hang on a second. This jar of pigment here, hang on, I can't see what I'm up to. This jar of pigment here, ah, lead yellow, okay. Yeah, lead yellow, potentially something I'd be interested in doing. So, I got this jar of pigment, which is labeled, um, I'll type the name in here into the chat. So that's the name of it, and I've never known what this is. It, I don't think it's heavy enough to be a lead pigment. It's quite, um, it's definitely not heavy enough to be a lead pigment. From a hardware store slash pigment artist shop in um, Rome. Um, and it's been a mystery pigment that I've had for about 10 years, and I have absolutely no idea what it is. And I, all the Googling in the world has never yielded any results from that name that's written on here. So, that confuses me. So if anyone ever figures this out, that'd be cool. I 
as you can see, gravity filtering is slow. So slow. Um, yeah, look, lead... By lead yellow, do you mean, like, lead chromate? Or do you mean... Um, um, like, uh, lead antimony? Ant ant antimony lead, so like Naples yellow, um, yeah, so Naples yellow, because lead chromate I've definitely made before, that's really, really easy to make, um, not necessarily great to have around because it's an incredibly toxic pigment because you both have lead and chromium together in this brilliant coloured pigment, but certainly not advisable. Um, lead chromate is super simple. You just take lead nitrate and uh, a, a chromate source like potassium dichromate or a, um, ammonium dichromate and you just mix them together and there you go, lead chromate. Super easy. I feel like I'm doing too many things at once here, but that's okay. Uh, so the name is the one that I posted just a little bit up in the chat there, and the only other markings on the container are the place that I bought it from. Uh, which, I'll type the place in to chat as well. So that's the place that I bought it from. Um, if you're ever in Rome, go to this place. It's incredible. Um, I mean, it was about 10 years ago that I went there, but I was getting these size jars of pigment for about 250, two euros a piece. Between two to five euros for a jar. And I mean, that's just so cheap. Um, and it was weird because it wasn't just like an art supply place, it was a hardware store as well. Um, yeah, incredible. Um, I assume their prices have gone up since then, but nonetheless. nearly there with this to a point where I can put it aside and this has extracted incredible color um maybe the sodium sulfate wash is the way to go because that's really cool mm Um, apologies, I'm just going to have to run to the bathroom real quick, so give me two minutes, um, and I'll be back in just a sec.
We're back. Um, I will be doing the mango soon enough, um, but I don't know exactly yet because there's still a lot to learn about that. Um, yes, lead chromate, you can use lead acetate, you just need any soluble lead source. And sodium chromate, um, potentially. Um, sodium dichromate, I don't know. Yeah, you could potentially use sodium chromate. Um, again, as long as it's a soluble chromate source and a soluble lead source, should have no problems. Whoopsies. Alright. Put this off to the side for now. Uh, yeah, sodium dichromate. Um, this is um, potassium dichromate here, but sodium dichromate should look exactly the same. It should just be this orange salt. Um, look fine. Um, just be really careful when working with it because. It's a very, very soluble source of a hexavalent um, uh, chromium source. So this is incredibly toxic stuff. Um, so gloves, be careful. And also be careful with rinsing it out and washing it out after you've finished using it and all that sort of stuff because uh, the Hexavalent chromates um, or chromiums are very damaging to like uh, aquatic water systems and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, if you're going to use it and you have a waste product of any of this sort of stuff, neutralize it with uh, like a sodium carbonate or something like that just to um, turn the chromium into a more sort of uh, like chromium oxide or something like that so that it's not soluble when you go washing it down the way of collecting waste, that's good too. Alright, that's hot enough now too. Um, that's the lead nitrate that I use. Um, so heavy. This is 200 grams in this small jar. Um, So you want a recap of what's going on with the difference between the two matters. So over in the filter, oh, I'll get to that question in a moment. So over in the filter, we've got yesterday's matter, which was the one we did in the bucket here. That was, and this is also the left from it. That was just, um, matter root that I had soaked overnight with a 1% um, sulfuric acid solution in it. The matter that we just filtered then, um, this one over here, this matter was one that we had soaked overnight in a strong solution of hydrochloric acid. And then this one here was the one that was soaked in um, sodium sulfate. So we have 1% sulfuric acid, 20% hydrochloric acid, and sodium sulfate. So they're the three little things that we're doing at the moment to see if there's any major advantage to one process over the other. So that we have, yeah, three different steps. Um, 
I know I keep sort of bouncing around from all the sorts of different things and So what I have here is, this is just the leftover from the first batch, the, the first batch. Um, this has already had pigment extracted from it, and we're just going to see if there's a second extraction from it can't yield a little bit more pigment from it before it's spent. Yes. So the sodium sulfate one was just equal volume of sodium sulfate to matter and soaked overnight. So there was no acid, nothing like that, just sodium sulfate. A little bit more sodium carbonate here. And we'll try and precipitate out some more pigment. I'll get to the vivonite question in just a moment, um, but I'll just keep working on this. So again, let's see if the two hot solutions makes a difference to the foaming. So you can see there, almost no pigment precipitating out as we add all of that in so despite its red color it doesn't actually appear to be much more pigment to precipitate out there there's a bit there's definitely a little bit but not that much so maybe we did get everything in the first run And that whatever was left in there was just so minuscule, it's enough to colour the liquid, but not enough to extract anything. We could mix up more soda and add it in. What do you think? Do you think we should add more soda and try and keep precipitating, or maybe it's just done for? Let's add more soda. Chromatography is something I would love to get into. It's just currently a little bit beyond my skill range. Um, I will get there. Um, it's just really complicated and have to be really precise. Um, that would definitely be a good way to work out what's going on, but I mean, that kind of data you can also look up. People have done sort of experiments. Um, for me, the observational data of how is the actual pigment when I'm done, and how does it what behave as a paint, that's sort of quantifiable enough. Um, yep, absolutely nothing. So that concludes that experiment. We now know that. We obviously got most of the most of the pigment out of there, so I could probably just discard this liquid now. It's probably the easiest thing to do. All right, back to the sodium sulfate. So. <laughs> what I think I'll do is um, paper chromatography isn't that fancy, you're right. Um, and I've been thinking about getting some stuff to do it. So I'm just making a bed of, um, just because I seem to be using all of my filters and things, I'm just going to make a bed of cotton wool in here, 
and we're just going to pour this liquid through because we don't want the plant material anymore, we just want the liquid. The liquid that's coming off of this is very, very bright. I think it's quite nicely done. That is just, it's probably one of the best liquids I've had so far. Uh, this looks like a very promising Pretty good. Yeah, look at this. This is just, it's like illuminating red. It's very, very clean and pure color. Um, Good. I think there might be some benefit to this the sulfate um, wash. Um, so the next step in this process is where this particular process really, really differs from all the others. Um, so we will go back to our Artist Pigments Volume 3 from the National Gallery of Washington and we will continue through the process here. Alright, so it says here, so what we did first, soaked overnight in sodium sulfate, and I'll bring up chat so I can see what's going on, so yeah, we soaked the matter overnight in sodium sulfate, we then washed and cleaned the matter, kept the root material, and to the root material we added a boiling solution of alum then we let the boiling solution of alum sit for 15 minutes we then washed it out and that's where we're at with this so this is our collected um, liquid which will have our coloring material in it now what it says to do the residue is washed with hot water to combine the filtrates so we've got to get this back up to a temperature of 50 degrees and to this we're going to add lead acetate. So we have, so it calls to add an equal volume of lead acetate. So because I started with 9 grams of matter, uh, I have 9 grams of lead acetate here. Which is partly the reason why I did this as a 9 gram batch because all I had was 9 grams of lead acetate. So I wanted to match to what I had. and. I just didn't have the time to go and make more lead acetate because it's a long, it's not a long process, it's just convoluted. Um, so now we're going to add the lead acetate to this and what will happen is we should precipitate out the sulfate, um, making lead sulfate. So let's clean this off. Thermometer. 
get the temperature going. So currently the liquid is at 34 degrees Celsius. How do you get lead acetate? Um, so I made this lead acetate by um, what I did is where is it? Um, essentially, I just got like a an Erlenmeyer flask. Hang on, I will show you. So that, uh, actually, no. All right. Uh, basically, you just boil lead in um, acetic acid. So vinegar. I have glacial acetic acid, which is pure 99% um, acetic acid. Um, I think you could use regular vinegar, but that's quite a lot less, quite a lot less strong. It's a, it's definitely not as strong a concentration of acetic acid. So. It was definitely quicker to, what I did is I had some chunks of lead that I hammered down into thin foil, so like lead foil, and I just put the chunks of, small chunks of lead into a, a Erlenmeyer flask in the fume cabinet and with the stir bar, which I've lost, um, I just stirred it with hot acid, glacial acetic acid. I may have diluted the acid a little bit. I may have even used vinegar. I can't quite remember. But essentially you just wait till all the lead is dissolved into the liquid and then you filter the liquid and then evaporate it and you'll get the crystals left. Um, which these aren't completely pure because it's slightly pinky in colour. Um, where's the thing? Um, and it still smells a little bit like acetic acid, but that's that's essentially what it is. Right. So it's coming up in temperature. It's uh 36 now. Yeah, vinegar's, yeah, max probably 10%. Um, glacial's 100%. Um, not that, like, I like working with glacial acetic acid. I, you know, you think, oh, it's how bad can 99% vinegar be? But that stuff is strong and really intense and the vapors that come off the glacial acetic acid are full on so just because we're used to vinegar doesn't mean that that's going to be any nicer this isn't very clean this beaker which is annoying i am um, constant cleaning of glassware Oh, it's on the outside, that's okay. Alright, so we'll just make up a little solution of the lead acetate here. Again, this is a lead compound, so we should be quite careful with it. Although the Romans used to use this to sweeten their wine, because lead acetate is called sugar of lead. super soluble. That acetate is very, 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 very soluble. As you can see, because it's not completely pure, I don't know what the impurities in there are, it's not a completely clear solution. It should be a completely clear solution. So there is obviously some slight degree of impurity in my lead acetate. Um, So we might actually filter this through 
when we put it into there. So let's grab ourselves another funnel. This is at 42 degrees now, so we need to get it up to the 50 degrees like it said. I have a bottle washer, it just broke, and I got an order coming of more beakers um, and test tubes and more glassware. I have tons more glassware up on here, like, I just, um, beakers are the things that I'm running out of, right. While we're waiting for that to get up to temperature, we could do some glassware showing off. So. Got this guy. This is a three head boiling flask um, for a round bottom mantle. Um, this is a really cool design, this one, because you can boil your plant material in here and because of the way that this thing works on here, you can, it's two pieces of ground glass together, so you can easily just open it up to get your plant material out rather than like a standard boiling flask. And this can hook up to all sorts of different distillation condensers and stuff like that. So this is a really cool piece of glassware. Then we have this, which is a big Graham condenser, um, which is really, really cool, which I've never been able to use. I just acquired this um, from somewhere. The problem with using it is this, see this ground glass attachment here? This is a really, this is a 55, 54 size attachment. It's just too big. I've got nothing to fit it onto. Um, I've looked at getting an adapter for it, but they're really expensive. But if I get an adapter, I could hook this up to a boiling flask and have this crazy um, condenser, which is really fascinating, massive condenser. So there's some cool things. All right, we're at 50 degrees. I'm just cleaning out this funnel. Uh, yeah, acetic acid. Alright, so this next step, what's going to happen is, because potassium alum is potassium aluminium sulfate, and lead acetate going in what's going to happen is the lead will react with the sulfate part and produce lead sulfate that's insoluble so that should drop out of solution and we should have some white lead sulfate at the bottom and I don't know what happens to the acetate which is interesting um, but then boil the lead into the acetic acid until it dissolves yes and then once the lead has dissolved in the acetic acid, you then can either boil it down and then just evaporate it in, until you get your lead acetate crystals. All right, so let's just go back to the um, book. So it says here, we combine the lead acetate in here at a temperature of 50 degrees, which, and the mixture is agitated intensively until all the sulfate is turned into lead sulfate. 
The deep red liquor is then removed from the lead sulfate. Um, okay, cool. All right, so let's go. There you go. You can see immediately we have lead sulfate forming at the bottom there. Yeah, the adapter for that uh, condenser, I found one company in the UK that make an adapter that will work for what I need. It's just about 70 or 80 pounds. So, once I actually have a need for that condenser, then I'll justify getting such a thing. So, let's put that to the side. And, there you go, you can see the lead is just dropping out of solution quite quickly. So let's just give this a stir to make sure that it's all, all collected. Quite a nice pink. And we're just gonna wait for that to drop out of solution. Which won't be too long because lead is just so heavy um, that it'll just crash straight down out of solution very quickly. You can see it right now. Let's just watch this. You know, it's up here at the moment. Give it another 10, 15 seconds. It's just dropping, dropping, dropping. It's really cool. Really took no time at all for that lead to just drop out there. Cool thing is, I'll probably be able to be able to probably be able to keep this lead sulfate and use it for something else. Because there's no point throwing it out. Well, one, I'm not going to throw it out because it's lead. Um, but two, you know, there'll be a use for it. I'm sure there's some pretty useful things to do with lead sulfate. For expedience sake, we'll just... 
I'm just going to filter this through some cotton wool, trying to avoid having the lead transfer across. Um, and then I'll, at a later date, collect the rest of that lead up and do something with it. But for now, I actually just want to see how this next step goes. Let's actually crank this up, get this nice and hot. There's a whole bunch of weird sort of flocculating stuff in here and I'm not sure what that is. Um, I can't really show it on the screen, but there's definitely something separating out from the liquid. Look at that, painfully slow. Well, that just drips away quietly there. Let's have a look. So that's what we got out of when we were filtering here. So this is the precipitate from the hydrochloric acid wash. Um, this is interesting um, it's a little bit more purple than I'm used to I'm not really sure what to make of this at the moment uh, I'll have to wait as it dries and I need to wash it a little bit more but currently as it stands it's definitely yeah, there's something more purple, I guess, about it than the standard pigment I extract. We'll do the side-by-side -side soon, but like, yeah, that's just where we're at with that one. Okay, let's just put it on some paper towel. It's still a nice color. There's nothing wrong with it. Alright, this is just taking forever. Um, let's get impatient and speed up the process. Yeah, it's a nice red color. It's it's the interesting thing, and I don't think this is showing up on the camera very well. Is it's more purple than I'm used to with the matter pigments. Um, so there's definitely something slightly different about it. Um, Just make up a cotton wool bed again because that's a nice quick way of filtering. And if we're taking slight shortcuts, then this is a good way of doing it.
So, what the next step of this process says to do is to take the liquid and boil it. So it says, take the deep red liquid that is removed from the lead sulfate deposit. Um, the entire red solution is now heated to boiling until a purple red sediment separates from the boiling solution. So it's brought to boiling, but not boiled. Um, it's interesting, there is a red sediment that's come off here, as you can see, which I'm wondering if that's partly the pigment coming out there. I'm not entirely sure. I may have made a slight mistake with this, but let's see what happens. Oh, we need this in there so we can keep an eye on the temperature. So we're at 50 degrees. And there is something precipitating out of here, which is really interesting. So just some questions while we're sort of waiting for this to heat up and other things. So I, I will plan to do a lot more of these live streams go, sort of as we move forward. Um, is there anything people would prefer to see? So like I'm looking into the idea of getting two cameras set up so that we can have one overview camera and then maybe an overhead camera or a closer in camera. Um, that could be nice. Um, would people like more sort of informative videos where we just do one thing slowly step by step or are you happy with this sort of mismatch of me jumping around doing a bunch of things um, all at once or are you happy just for me to have the stream going while I work um, so yeah just yeah let me know what what you would like to see from doing these streams here because trying to figure out what level of detail and intensity to go into like do people like the sort of in-depth figuring out of these chemical processes informative video okay so like where i focus on like one particular pigment and try and go into as much detail about the theory and stuff as that Because the problem is I'm not great at actual chemistry theory, I'm more practical, hands-on.
we're at 73 degrees so we'll just get this up to about 80 or 90 I think Yes, to have a map of what I did. Um, what I'll do, I think, after this is I will write up all my notes and when all the pigments are dry and finished, what we'll do is we'll do another little stream, maybe in a couple of days, where I'll sit down with my notes from all of this work and we can actually look and we can paint out a sample of each paint and talk about each process and potential improvements. All right, I think this is probably good now. So, I don't know, let's get in close there. I don't know if you can see that there is like a sediment pigment that's separated out of the liquid. Um, which is really cool because we haven't done any, any soda in this at all. We'll just filter this pigment off here. I think I slightly messed up this pigment, um, which is okay. I think because um, so this was the cotton wool. Hang on, I'll come around. This was the cotton wool that. Um, came off when I was trying to um, pour the liquid off of the lead sulfate and it's filled with a really deep red pure paste which I think is partly the pigment separating out too early um, so we might have lost a bunch of the really nice color in that stage because I don't know if I added the lead sulfate hot enough or something um, I'm not entirely sure what went wrong there, but, like, I don't know, there's something really beautiful about whatever that colour there was, that pigment, um, and the pigment we're getting here in this that I'm filtering off is not nearly as brilliant in colour. It's a lot paler. So something slightly went wrong. I'll show you. So like, here's the lead sulfate on the bottom and the liquid on top and it's almost impossible for me to show in the camera but there is some sort of thing flocculating around in that red liquid there which I think is part of the pigment. So, I think we ended up losing most of our pigment in here, which means that essentially what happened is we added the lead acetate to the mixture, maybe not hot enough, and the pigment separated out at the same time as the lead acetate. Um, and then 
That's a good point. Yes, I could I could recover this by dissolving the cotton wool. Um, what would I dissolve the cotton wool in that wouldn't damage the pigment? Well, actually, we can dissolve the pigment. Um, I think the pigment is will dissolve in hydrochloric acid, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe if we just dissolve the pigment and leave the cotton wool. Oh, actually, I can just probably rinse this in water. Um, that'll probably also work. Let's just take this now and just put it into this beaker and add some water. See if we can't just soak it out. Yeah, see the cotton wool is mostly empty now, but we've definitely deposited something in there. So we might have we might have recovered a little bit of it. But it's interesting, look how clean that is. Um in terms of its colour. Um I feel like there is real potential in this lead lead process um, hmm yeah I'm really into that the only problem will be is if I need tons of lead sulfate um, or lead acetate in order to keep doing this process um, I guess I could also use barium, some sort of bar barium chloride could also work. Um, yeah, that's really good. Where did I boil the lead? Um, what I did is I just boiled it in an Erlaminer flask, so it's one of these, and I think I had something like, I would have had like a stopper with a glass thing in the Erlaminer flask so that the vapors could go off, and then I think I just directed the vapors out through my exhaust fan in my fume cabinet so that um, oh yeah that or you could use a reflux um, scenario so like what you could do is you could put your lead in a round bottom boiling flask and then put a condenser on top and run the water through so that your acetic acid just vaporizes up, condenses, and then just drips back down, and then you're just refluxing the thing. Um, barium's only a tiny bit safer than lead. Barium's pretty toxic as well, but um, definitely a little bit better. Um, but yeah, so making your lead acetate this way, just through a reflux, would be a good good situation as well. Again, you want you can either connect this to something else to vent any vapors that do escape, but refluxing as well should be a good way to keep 
so you don't lose any of the acetic acid either. No, not smoking room, um, fume cabinet. Um, like a extraction hood. Um, so it's like a glass cabinet with a fan that sucks it out. <laughs> smoking room. The smoking room's another place. So we're just collecting what we recovered from the cotton wool there, and the fume cabinet there. Yes, I um I made it myself, so I don't trust it for anything really dangerous. But if I'm boiling any sort of sort of acids so like hydrochloric acid or, or heating acids and anything that I think any sort of fume that's coming off could be potentially bad I do it in there because it's definitely preferable um, I would never trust it completely um, but I trust it enough that it helps yes I use the cupboard in other videos so I don't know if you can see there, that's what we recovered from the cotton wool and that is just, I mean on the video, it, it's definitely way cleaner and purer red colour than this one here for example. Um, so let, let's get... Uh, we'll get we'll get in closer so we can show you side by side what they look like. We'll just we'll, what we'll do is we'll waste a few bits of filter paper. Let's get this. So, let's try and assess these the best we can. Right, so that's the one we just got off the cotton wool, and that's the other one.
you can see that this one is this one's got sort of a dullness to it there's a sort of purpliness to it and it's a little bit dirtier in color whereas this one is a much more pure perfect vibrant red so this is the one that we used the lead acetate on and the sodium sulfate to clean it up this one was the pigment we got from the hydrochloric acid soak um, and we're still filtering the first batch of just the regular stuff but that extra purification step with the sodium sulfate and then the lead acetate definitely has resulted in a, a more vibrant pure red color so it's probably a cleaner alizarin with less impurities in it as opposed to this one which has more impurities in it so that's a success for me um, I guess the trick will be figuring out how um, So the trick will be to figure out how um, how to separate the the red liquid from the lead sulfate before the um, pigment wants to solidify and become uh, solid. That's that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, But yeah, oh, I'm really happy. That's really cool. Pure product through doing a purification process. Uh, it's always nice when you read the theory about something and then you actually go and try it and it actually works. Um, it's, is it possible that any lead left could react with some of the pigments you also make for, for printing? What do you think? Um... There shouldn't be any lead left in this at all. Um, all the lead... The lead really wants to become lead sulfate. And it really wants to drop out of there and, and get the hell out. Like, I'll wash this a few more times, but there shouldn't be any lead left in this whatsoever. Not to mention lead sulfate is quite stable. It's a very, very stable thing. You can use it as an extender in oil paints and stuff like that. It's definitely had its uses throughout art history. So, I'm not worried about there being any lead left in there. I mean, I would definitely wash this quite a few more times, but... I think this is one of the cleanest and most pure samples of matter I've ever extracted. So, shame it's such a tiny amount. Like, almost unusable. Let's check on our original... And this is our first batch here, which is also quite nice. Um, quite vibrant and red. Um, I'll come in closer with that too. So this is what we precipitated out yesterday. Um, And this is what we just did with the lead. Let's compare these two. So again, you can see this is a little bit deeper and a bit more crimson uh, as opposed to the lead acetate one. Um, it's quite nice. It's very deep. Um, it's kind of what I'm used to as a color. It still has tiny off tones of slight brownness and stuff, which I think are very, very difficult to see on camera. Um, it's definitely better than the uh, hydrochloric acid wash. I think we can disregard that method 
and not necessarily working very well. So this was just the 1% sulfuric acid soak. Um, it's a very nice color. It's very good. I'm actually really happy with that. Soaking in the sulfuric acid overnight is really quite a good method. Um, it's definitely the least amount of work. All right, well, that's... Uh, let's have a quick look at this one too. This is the... This is what we um, got out of when we boiled the um, boiled that solution there. Um, it's also really pure mm -hmm. color. Um, that's not showing up very correctly though. Um, so it's quite pink, um, but it's quite clean in color. Um, it's pretty good, and for no sodium carbonate being added, this is really interesting that we have this pigment. So, um, so we definitely, like, that's the red that we've got from the cotton wool, and that's, like, they're, they're obviously miles apart in, in color intensity. So we definitely messed something up slightly in that process. Plus, consider that you didn't ferment the solution for a week like it's supposed to. Yes, I didn't. Um, but given that the... Um, perhaps the lead may make the product dry quicker if used for making oil paints. Um, again, I don't, the, there should be no lead left in the pigment here. All the lead should have ended up here. That should be where all the lead ended up. Um, so there should be none of the lead in the actual pigment. Um, but yeah, so I think what we learned here was the sulfuric acid soak, the 1% sulfuric acid soak is good, it yields a good thing, and I think I definitely should try doing it for a week, like fermenting it with sulfuric acid for a week. Um, the hydrochloric acid wash was less successful and the lead acetate sodium sulfate was quite good too, um, but needs some work on that. Um, I think I'll leave the stream here today, so it'll be a bit of a shorter one, um, just so that I can, you know, finish all this stuff up, let everything dry, and then... I will write up sort of a, a, a report of all the things that I did and we will assess all of the pigments when they're dry and finished. Um, and yeah, so um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll check back in with everybody in a couple of days and when this is all set and then also, it'll give me some time to figure out some extra camera stuff and just create a slightly nicer setup so that we can do this a bit more focused. And hopefully the copper nitrate will have come later in the week or maybe next week sometime. Um, and then we can sit down and start exploring the copper colors. Um, also, would people prefer if I did some more produced videos for the channel? Because um, I have some ideas um, for doing some produced videos as well. Um, or do we prefer just sticking with some live streams at the moment while everybody's stuck in quarantine? So, let us know. Let us know what you'd prefer. Um, yeah, I'm really happy with today's results. It all worked out pretty well. I'm actually really happy with this sulfuric acid wash one. Um, I look forward to seeing that dry. It's a really nice, deep red. It's a good quality one. So, yeah, thanks to everybody who dropped by today. Um, 
especially the people in Europe who are staying up super late for this. I will try and figure out a time that works well for not just me here, but works really well for people both in the US and Europe, because I think it's hard because you guys, the way you're separated and in time zones and stuff like that, but it would be nice to try and figure out something that works out reasonably well for everybody. Um, but yeah, so I hope everybody has a good night slash day and I'm going to go make some lunch again. It's that time of the day. Um, so thank you.